cows don't milk themselves with milk with dignity and um, farm worker rights in the time of COVID uh, with our um, friends of migrant justice. Um, I am gonna do some housekeeping um, stuff before we, we start. And we're gonna start with language justice. So Maria, do you wanna do this one and then Xiomara the next one? Maria, we can't hear you. Your headphones are not working again. Sorry. Are they working now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you see the green in your screen, it's working. If not. It, it doesn't change in the screen at all. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, para encontrar la interpretación, eh, estas son las maneras. En la computadora, eh, se busca el glóbulo Zapacha eh, en don, y dice interpretación, se busca el lenguaje, será en español en esta ocasión eh, y después se, termi eh, se pone terminar o finalizar y así debería estar funcionando en su computadora. Si usted tiene un teléfono el, eh, inteligente, busca la parte de abajo en su pantalla donde están los tres eh, puntos que dicen más, apache ahí, busque interpretación de idioma seleccione el idioma español y apache finalizado para asegurarse que funcione la interpretación. Gracias. Um, so this is the way we're gonna, um, you're gonna access the interpretation. We're gonna be interpreting um, simultaneously. If you if you are using a laptop, a computer, um, you press the icon. Can you put the slide back? Can you press you press the icon, the word icon, um, and then that will prompt you to the languages available. In this case, you choose English. Um, once you do that, you press done, and and that will give you the interpretation. That is on the computer. If you go to the smartphone. Um, then on the smartphone at the at the bottom, you will see three dots. More, you press on that, then that will take you to the um, different languages. Uh, in this case, English and Spanish, you choose the one you, you want to, it will be English. Uh, and then you press done, and then uh, you will be able to access interpretation. If anything happens, you cannot hear us, any problems at all, just uh, write it on the chat um, and we will be checking it periodically uh, if there is any issue. So I'm gonna start the language interpretation now and you will see it in the bottom of your screen. Um, okay, so you can look for it now and choose your language. Ahora lo vas a ver en la parte de abajo de tu pantalla o en tu teléfono en más. Y puedes escoger tu lenguaje. Uh, cuando escuches a las intérpretes, por favor, uh, mándame un mensaje por el chat. When you are able to hear the interpreters, please um, send me a message on the chat. We're going to do some um, trials. Uno, dos, tres, uno, dos, tres. One, two, one, two.
Now I'm gonna continue my slideshow. Prácticas de justicia del lenguaje. I don't know who's doing the English. Nuestros movimientos son multilingües. Se requiere un compromiso de todos el crear espacios multilingües. Comentarios en el chat serán traducidos en vivo. Si pueden, hagan su comentario en inglés y español para que todos podamos accederlos. Despacio, habla a un ritmo más lento. Así podemos um, comprenderte. So, vamos a usar el símbolo de despacio. Si ustedes están hablando muy rápido, la intérprete y, y yo vamos a hacer este movimiento. En voz alta, hable fuerte y claro. Vamos a usar esta señal para poderlos escuchar. Si están hablando muy bajito, vamos a usar la señal. Un micrófono a la vez, solamente podemos interpretar por una persona a la vez. La inclusividad de género, eh, en el español usamos la letra E al final uh, de los adjetivos. Regularmente se usa la A o la O, que son género masculino o femenino, pero queremos crear una inclusividad de género y estamos utilizando la letra E en vez. Um, ahora esto está en inglés. Gonna switch. Our commitment to racial justice at NOFA Mass, we're working to deepen our commitment to racial equity and justice, including honest work, examining whiteness and dismantling systems of white supremacy that are part of many dominant systems, including our food systems. The foundation of modern organic agriculture is rooted in the long-standing cultural practices of BIPOC communities. We acknowledge that the U.S. was built on stolen land and that the food system was built on the stolen labor of Black, Indigenous, Latin, and Asian, and other people of color. Please take a moment to find your location on this map and honor those whose land you now occupy. Racial equity in action. For all BIPOC participants, we're gonna hold the BIPOC caucus on Sunday, January 16, uh, 1 to 2 p.m., which is a space for people of color to come together to celebrate and talk about sustaining our communities, healing from racial trauma, and working to organize collectively for systemic change. For Spanish speakers, we're gonna hold a sala en español, a Spanish lounge, Um, el domingo 16 de enero, tomorrow at 5.30 to 6.30. And for white allies and co-conspirators, here are some ways to uh, center racial equity in your own work and support BIPOC communities. Share resources, including land, money, and tools with BIPOC organizations, such as the Urban Farming Institute, Gardening in the Community, the African Alliance and the Native American Rights Fund, Indigenous Peoples Network and Picasso Pukenokeland Trust. Support legislation that will begin um, the talk and advance the work towards reparations and protect the rights of farm and food workers. 
Now some etiquette, etiquette um, info. Um, this account is set to mute participants upon entry. To speak, simply press the microphone icon at the bottom of your screen, or I think it's star 69 in your phone. Please mute yourself when you are done speaking to avoid background noise interfering with other speakers. Hosts might do this for you as needed. Feel free to use the chat feature to uh, comment in uh, any point. Oops. I knew this was gonna happen. Sorry about that. Okay, please mute yourself when you are done speaking to avoid background noise interfering with other speakers. Host might do this for you as needed. Feel free to use the chat feature to comment at any point during the workshop. The host will check the chat periodically during this session and the presenter will leave time at the end to address questions in the chat. Please note that this session is being recorded. Gold sponsors. Um, we couldn't do this work without our gold sponsors. Uh, please uh, go in the um, online book um, and check them out. Um, also, we have silver sponsors. Also, we couldn't do this work without them. Um, and they're in our community doing great work. Also, we have an online auction, so please make sure to check it out. We will put the link in the chat. Um, it's a lot of good products and is already getting a lot of success. So this is the way we have funds to do um, also our work. Also, we have a virtual vendor listings online for special discount codes, view uh, or vendor video presentations in your program book. Um, it's interactive. And I think I am all set. So I'm gonna introduce my speakers. Um, and I want to first introduce um, the migrant justice uh, group. It's a farm worker found, founder grassroots organization led by immigrant dairy workers in the Vermont area. Mm -hmm. Migrant uh, justice works to build the voice, capacity, and power um, of the farm worker community. So, Without further ado, Madeline, that we we gonna start with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we had a little change in plans where I'm gonna start, and my colleague Thelma is gonna join us. Um, I think she'll be joining with the name Lupita, but she's having a problem with the heat and needs to go to a different place where there's internet. So ho hopefully she'll be back on real soon. Um, but in the meantime, I'll start out. So. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm part of the organization Migrant Justice um, and my role within Migrant Justice is working with allies. So um, volunteers, interns, um, other organizations to support the leadership of the farm worker community. So I'm thrilled and honored to be here with NOFA Mass. Um, and uh, when Thelma joins us, we'll, I'll um, make sure to make a space for her to introduce herself. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can look at some um, some slides together. I'm going to make you a co-host. Okay, probably. cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with migrant justice, um, <clears throat> migrant justice is a, a grassroots organization that was founded by and is led by the immigrant farm worker community in Vermont. Migrant justice works to build the voice, capacity, and power of the farm worker community and engage allies to advance human rights and economic justice. And uh, since this is a fairly uh, small group, I think um, we like to ask who, who's heard of migrant justice? Anybody in the audience familiar with, with the organization? Feel free to just like take yourself off mute and share. Um, I hadn't been, but I am now. So. <laughs> awesome. Great. Yeah. Well, um, to share a little bit more about um, migrant justice, the organization got started about 10 years ago and actually began um, because of a, a tragedy, uh, the death of a, a young man named Jose Obe, who is actually the, the person on the um, left side of the screen standing in the snow. Um, it was a, an 18 year old farm worker who was killed in a, a preventable uh, farming accident at work in Vermont. Um, on a dairy farm. And this tragedy really um, revealed this community that um, had been invisibilized and was working to sustain the dairy industry in Vermont. Um, and that became a real spark for farm workers to start organizing and start coming together. And um, people started to gather in um, farm worker assemblies, which um, were places to, to share food, to uh, connect, to be social, but also to identify problems and issues and, and identify common problems um, and do popular education and then start talking about collective solutions. And so out of these spaces, um, these assemblies, um, the community started to define this, this map of, um, of human rights priorities. Uh, and that became the, the guide for the organization, the different campaigns and so um, one of the first campaigns was organizing for access um, to driver's licenses, which we know is a, is a big campaign in Massachusetts as well. Um, also, there's been a big focus on stopping de fighting deportations and, and stopping deportations in some cases, um, and also passing um, what's called a no mas poli negra or um, the separation of, of police and immigration. Um, uh, over the years, um, there was always this strong focus on the, um, the need for the right to fair work and dignified housing. Um, and that's because to, to give a little bit more context, um, in Vermont, it's really immigrant workers that are sustaining the dairy industry, um, and not just in Vermont, but around the country. In Vermont, between 80 to 90% of non-family dairy workers on farms um, are from Mexico and Central America. The work is all year round, it's 24 seven. Um, and the farms in Vermont are, are mostly small farms. It's not like um, states like Wisconsin or California. They're fairly small farms and Vermont is a very rural state. So, um, there's a lot of issues with isolation. Um, there'll be farms literally like at the end of a dirt road, kind of in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and two surveys that um, Migrant Justice conducted um, where workers were worker to worker asking about conditions, um, it was revealed that about half of all the, of the farm workers in the state were making below minimum wage, below the state minimum wage working between 60 and 80 hours a week, and oftentimes without even one day off a week. And people are um, living where they work and working where they live because housing is almost always provided on farms. And so issues with housing um, are also really, really big things like um, old and dilapidated housing, uh, sometimes really overcrowded conditions where two or three people have to share uh, a bedroom. 
issues with um, with having like running water that's drinkable, having heat. Um, and then also at work, um, seeing a real high percentage of accidents and injuries for uh, things like working with chemicals, heavy machinery, large animals, and that combined with an access to lack of uh, labor protections and a lack of access to healthcare. Um, we also see um, a lot of issues with um, people being exposed to sexual harassment and gender discrimination um, and things like unjust firings um, and even in some cases violence and human trafficking on farms. But despite um, lots and lots of issues in the industry, um, there are also some farms where the, the conditions aren't, aren't so bad and so we know that it doesn't have to be like this. And so um, this, doing this, this analysis of, of conditions in the community and in the industry, um, farm workers were, were asking questions like, why, why are conditions like this? Why? why are the uh, conditions on farms so bad? And then even on farms where the farmers are trying to do right by the workers there, um, they're facing really huge economic challenges. Um, and we see farms going out of business right, right and left in Vermont and across the country. Um, so to understand the situation at its root, um, we had to really look at the industry uh, structure as a whole. And that led us to start to look at corporate supply chains. And so this slide shows uh, a pyramid and it's actually a, a photo of like a big cardboard piece, uh, piece of, um, of artwork that we use for, for doing um, political education, but it shows how the, how the supply chain um, works. You see um, how the power is structured. At the bottom, there are workers um, and then um, farms sell the milk to dairy cooperatives who sell the milk then to processing plants. And then from there, it's the, uh, the big brands that are owned by corporations that then sell the, the actual product and are making the, the money and actually have control over the, the pricing of milk in the industry. And we've seen that with fewer and fewer buyers, um, that means that the power gets consolidated at the top and that actually lowers the price of milk. And all of that creates this downward pressure on labor conditions. And right now it's crazy, but the, the price of milk is actually on par with what it was in the 1970s. So doing this kind of analysis um, of the supply chain um, really re reveals that, that farm workers and also farmers share a lot of the same interests in transforming this industry that's really squeezing squeezing them, them both in, in similar ways. And that it's companies at the top that are responsible for the problems um, and should be, should be held responsible for helping create the, the solutions as well. Um, and so this analysis actually comes from uh, a global um, model of social change that's called worker-driven social responsibility. Um, and there are other countries and workers working in other sectors that have been learning these same, same lessons about how to advance rights within, within um, corporate supply chains. And so Migrant Justice actually learned from another farm worker organization called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, um, which is based in Florida, um, in the tomato industry, where they had created, they have created um, what they call the Fair Food Program and have agreements with 14 major companies, uh, companies like Walmart, McDonald's, Burger King, um, where they're, they're using this model of worker-driven social responsibility to protect workers' rights within the, the supply chain of these companies. So farm workers in Vermont learned from the coalition of monthly workers and actually went to, <laughs> to Florida to see how this program was working um, and then came back to Vermont to figure out how to adapt 
the program, this, this model to the dairy industry. <clears throat> um, and so this is a photo also of garment workers in Bangladesh um, who are targeting global fashion brands um, with the fire safety accord. Um, there's also construction workers in Minnesota who are um, working, organizing to target developers um, and building respect and dignity, and there's many more. So this model, organizing um, in supply chains and winning contracts with corporations um, to implement programs that are designed by workers themselves has been really, um, really powerful and is uniting worker groups. Um, and at the same time, uh, there are companies that, um, that treat the reality of labor abuses in their supply chain as um, just like a, a public relations problem. Um, and there are these programs that are created without the, the key elements uh, of being worker driven. And these are really like false solutions that evade the responsibility um, and can be really tricky for consumers uh, who are seeing these like really attractive labels at the store. And so one example that um, we've been seeing uh, of that is a program that's called uh, Fair Trade Certified from the Fair Trade USA. Because to, to really be, be real, a social responsibility program has to be led by workers and has to have real, real uh, enforcement mechanisms to, to truly protect workers' rights. Um, so to talk more about Milk with Dignity and how it's been adapted, um, how this model has been adapted um, to the dairy industry. Um, um, migrant justice um, signs legally binding agreements with corporations for them to take responsibility for conditions within their, their dairy supply chain. Um, and the way it works then is that the corporation commits to, to only buying from farms within the program. And part of that is paying them a premium, so, so extra money for their milk. Farms then that are receiving that premium um, have to commit to use it to comply with a code of conduct, which is written by, by farm workers themselves. And that code of conduct includes standards for things like wages, hours and rest, housing, health and safety, and it creates protections against harassment, discrimination, and really importantly against retaliation. And so this code of conduct was created by, by the, um, the farm worker community in Vermont and really represents the, the community's definition of dignified work. But for those standards to be meaningful, the farm also has to allow migrant justice to educate uh, farm workers on their rights within the program. And that way workers are empowered and have the tools to become um, frontline defenders of, of their rights. And so that's what you see happening in this photo here is, is an education session on a, a dairy farm within the Milk of Dignity program. And then to ensure that the farm actually complies with the code, because that's that's really important as well, is, is like the, the teeth, we call it the teeth of the program is that Migrant Justice created uh, an independent organization to monitor conditions and to respond to complaints. Um, and they also do audits uh, every year of all the farms in the program. And so that organization is called the Milk with Dignity Standards, um, the Milk with Dignity Standards Committee. And um, they're really the, the monitoring body of the, the program, which is super important. And if a farm doesn't comply with that, that code of conduct, the, the Milk with Dignity Standards um, Council can actually suspend that farm. That's, that's the, um, the incentive is that, or, or not the incentive, that's the, the result um, is that if a farm is suspended, is suspended from the program, it, it loses that premium, the extra money that's coming down from the top from the milk, but it also loses the ability to, to sell their milk to the company. Um, and so there's real, um, real consequences um, for farms to, to comply uh, with the standards. And so the first company 
that we invited to, to join Mocha Dini was Ben and Jerry's. And um, Ben and Jerry's has this reputation for being socially responsible. And so that's part of the reason why um, farm workers decided to, to contact Ben and Jerry's first, but they didn't accept at the beginning. Uh, they, uh, they weren't interested in this program. They didn't see why a, an ice cream company um, should be worried about or responsible for dairy workers when they're, they're the ones making ice cream. Um, and it took almost three years of public pressure um, and, and talks to, to bring them to the table. Um, and those three years were, were full of things like protests in front of stores, street theater, um, picketing at their board meeting. Um, farm workers launched a, a 13 mile march from the capital of Vermont to the um, Ben and Jerry's factory. Um, and then hosted a, a or coordinated a, a speaking tour where farm workers went all across up and down the East Coast um, doing presentations and, and spreading the word about this campaign. Um, and so as the, the pressure mounted and mounted, finally, um, Ben and Jerry's came to the table and, and signed on to Milk with Dignity on October 3rd of 2017. Uh, and that's what this photo is from. This is a photo from that day. Um, it, it was a, a truly historic moment and the first time in history that uh, a corporation sat down at the table and, and signed an agreement with dairy workers. And something in this in this picture that I think is really inspiring is um, you can see all the signatures on the left side of this poster, uh, and the people who are in front there um, are part of the coordinating committee of Migrant Justice, which is the the leadership of the organization. And you can see there's a lot of people, there's a lot of names there. Whereas Ben and Jerry's has uh, a CEO, and so that's that's the guy with the glasses on the on the right, and his signature is sitting all by itself on Ben and Jerry's side. So you can really see the, the power of the community here. Um, and so um, 2017, it's been uh, several years since, and um, local dignity has been implemented in 100% now of Ben and Jerry's Northeast supply chain. It covers 260 farm workers and um, represents about 20% of the dairy industry in Vermont. Plus there's a few farms in New York state. And so Migrant Justice is giving in-person education sessions. Um, farm workers confidence in the program has been growing. Um, people are empowered to call the support line um, and have become monitors also of, of their own rights, which um, is something that, that would have been impossible outside of the program. Um, and the Milk with Dignity Standards Council um, is working to answer those calls, investigating cases, um, doing their yearly audits of farms, and ensuring that the um, farm employers comply with that code of conduct. And through the program, millions have flowed from Ben and Jerry's directly into farm workers' pockets in the forms of things like raises, bonuses, uh, paid vacations, and more. Um, and then what's left over is also going to the farm as economic relief for, for the low prices to support farms. And so in this way, we, we really believe that, that a new day has arrived for dairy. And so I wanna take a moment to um, share a video here of uh, testimonies um, from workers who are within the program. I'm just going to put that
mi trabajo empezando, empezando, pues nos levantamos a la mañana, ah, llegamos, prendemos las máquinas, arreglamos todo, sacamos las vacas del corral, las metemos para pa ordeñar. Pues es todo lo que se hace. Hay subtítulos en inglés. Hay ranchos que trabajan de 12 horas corridas, le dan media hora de comida, de las 12 horas, eso está más, más pesado. ¿Por qué es necesario? ¿Por qué es importante para nosotros como trabajadores que salimos de nuestra casa para, para mejorar nuestras vidas, no para, para estar viviendo como, como te dijera, en, en condiciones que meramente ya no son humanas? Pero sin el programa nosotros pues no, no nos aumentaban el sueldo y pues del día de descanso ni se hablara. No sabíamos qué derechos o qué podemos exigir nosotros como trabajadores. Pues antes, antes aquí no, no nos tomaban en cuenta como cuando nos enfermaban. Ni nos llevaban al doctor y pues ese día lo teníamos que trabajar. Y si no lo trabajábamos, pues ese día pues era descontado prácticamente. Y pues ahora bajo el programa de leche con dignidad, mmm, no lo trabajamos y pues aparte no nos pagan, no nos pagan y, y pues ya los patrones no, no llevan al doctor y pues eso es muy importante para, bueno, para, para mí, para nosotros. Bueno, se siente uno más, más protegido eh, porque ya sabe uno puede, o sea, ellos te, te orientan a lo, que, a lo que puede pasar, a lo que tus derechos que tú tienes como trabajador. Eh, el derecho que tiene el respeto tanto de tu patrón eh, se siente uno más, más feliz cosa más protegida si un día yo por ejemplo cuando voy a tirar cal en los grupos o hacer el agua de las patas no tengo las eh, las mascarillas los guantes este todo lo que necesito para que no, no me dañe mi salud entonces ya el patrón tiene que acceder a, a comprar las cosas Ahora ya tenemos un día completo, que antes no, no se tenía. Bueno, ahora que tengo mi bebé, pues ya, ya pasamos más tiempo con ella. Ya tenemos un, un, por lo menos un día para estar con ella todo el día. Se siente uno más seguro por todos lo, los beneficios pues, y, y saber todos nuestros derechos. Mediante el programa se es se ha hecho posible tener una casa nueva, porque antes estábamos en una traila que, este, que estábamos más amontonados. Dos personas en un cuarto, eh, poco espacio. Entonces aquí la nueva vivienda pues, ha cambiado demasiado porque todo es nuevo. Hay algunas personas que le dan miedo para hablar con los dueños o exigirle algo que, que ocupan o cualquier cosa. Ya sea porque pues, tienen miedo porque las corran o algo así y los despidan del trabajo. Con, con el programa nos hace trabajar mejor, más, más a gusto, más, este, más este, en confianza con los dueños, sabiendo cuáles son nuestros derechos, o sea, de no ser este, o sea, humillado o, decir, o que te digan cosas que, que te ofendan. O sea, hay muchos ranchos que, que pasa eso y por el programa no puede, ya no puede pasar eso. Como los, los del rancheros también se benefician mucho por ese por el programa. Así, yo creo que ambos, ambos tienen un gran beneficio, como nosotros, un gran beneficio entre ambos. Y para mí es muy importante que expanda el programa porque por eso el patrón le apoyan a él, pero tampoco también como nosotros como trabajadores tenemos esa voz de ya decir, sabes, quiero un día de descanso, quiero que esto, quiero que hagas esto, y eso es algo, es, es algo necesario para cada trabajador, para que nosotros nos sintamos seguros en decir algo, no nos sintamos con miedo, sintamos la seguridad de decirle al patrón, sabes que quiero esto, y ya no tengamos tanto miedo a ellos.
Okay. And I'm going to take it off share screen just, just for a moment uh, while I get the uh, presentation back up. Um, and, um, but yeah, I want to invite folks to stretch, take a minute, <laughs> shake, shake out your arms and your legs. <laughs> um, and also what kind of, I'm curious to hear what kind of reflections folks have after watching the video and, and hearing, we're going to talk more about milk with dignity and current campaigns. Um, but we'd love if a couple of folks just want to share about what, what did you think about the video? Like? Feel free to just take yourself off mute. Um, I guess I, I was struck by, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's tragic to me that the victories they're describing aren't like a bare minimum, um, of course, and, and I know that's, you know, the goal of, of migrant justice. I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess my feeling is anybody who would choose to abuse workers shouldn't be an owner in the first place, and, and that should, you know, essentially be treated as a crime not, you know, a, a standard. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering if you, if there is kind of like a pathway beyond that, that migrant justice is envisioning. Um, and if you've like worked with cooperatives or um, I don't know, to, to where uh, workers are really in charge of their own rights um, and, and not kind of like subject to an owner who's being held accountable and, and you know, forced to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a really, um, yeah, hearing someone say, you know, like having one day off is such a big achievement. It's, we really see that this program as the, the minimum, is as like the bare minimum, and, and really just the beginning. And that through having these kind of protections, like, um, like uh, protection from retaliation being a really big one. That, that opens up the space for people to to organize and to fight for more and that's something that that we've started to see on farms where um it's a requirement through this program uh the state minimum wage of vermont but then um where folks got together and said hey like you need to pay us more than that we deserve more than that uh, and if you don't we're not going to keep working here and so those things those kinds of things have been really really powerful and, and we'll talk more and I think we can get more into like the the the, the heart of, of your question maybe at the end and have more of a discussion but yeah other other reflections comments it's a, it's a question in the chat and I think Elizabeth has to coming up so the question in the chat is are there allied ally organization for other types of farms other populations how can someone help organize? Cool. I would say hold on to that because that's the whole second half of the, <laughs> the presentation. Well, we'll we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, Elizabeth, the yes. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I've known some of the organizers of migrant justice since they first got started, like Kike. Mm -hmm. um, he, when he was 19 and first in this country, he took one of the trainings with the Agricultural Justice Project. And at that point, he was such a, just a young green guy. And he has grown so enormously in courage to stand up the way he has and his ability to, to speak up for himself and for other workers. But I think that's one of the wonderful things that migrant justice has accomplished that I admire so much. But I want to say that from our experience in the Agricultural Justice Project, our approach to um, getting better working conditions for both farm workers and other workers in the food system has been to appeal to um, employers who have good values and to ask them to adopt better standards. And we offer all kinds of resources and how they can improve those standards. We have gone to the outstanding brands in organic and asked them. And they're all very interested at first. But as soon as the marketing people in their company step in, they say, well, no one's heard of this brand. 
So why would we bother to adopt it? And the approach that works is what Migrant Justice did, does, which is shaming the brands into accepting the deal, forcing them to. That's a sad story. That's the way it is. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so let's get into the part of the conversation um, where we focus on organizing and what's what's going on right now with Milk for Dignity. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Thelma, who I think is is now on the call, and let um, let her introduce herself, and then I'll I'll start to share my screen again so we can see some more slides. Hola, todos. Me pueden escuchar. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. I want to say sorry because I wanted to do the first part with my friend, but something happened here in my house. Um, and it's been very cold. Um, and it's been very hard. I was looking for a little bit of space to be able to talk. Um, and Madden was able to do that for me and talk for a little. Um, now we get to talk a little bit more about what changes we have made. Um, I was a worker and I didn't know anything about um, my rights. I was working 14 hours a day and I was faced with all the situations that the workers were faced with. And with Milk with Dignity, uh, there's been a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of changes now, like they're talking about. Ahora estar dando las educaciones y poder decirle a los trabajadores cuál es el. Now they're talking about um, the education. It, like, it, it froze. I cannot make out what she's saying. It froze. Or it's freezing. En el canal de español. I am in the English one, but I think her connection is bad because I cannot hear her and she froze. Can you hear me in English? Okay. Yep. I can hear now. Okay, gracias. Entonces, I was saying that now that I'm an organizer and I'm uh, teaching um, in different forms uh, to other co-workers about their rights. And that has been a big impact I lost her again. Entonces, uh, pero no significa que todos but, estamos como los ranchos que están en el programa. That, hay muchos compas. That doesn't mean that uh, we are all well and done. There are many farms uh, and, and co workers that are not. I lost her again. Her connection is not good. Uh, we don't we don't hear you good is is a cutting off um Thelma's asking me if I can take over because it, it seems like the the service is is not good where she is I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in and just uh, share my screen here. Yeah. 
Um, so I think um, someone was talking about more about um, the impacts of the milk with dignity program um, and and the huge um, changes that that we've been seeing on farms. Um, and this photo is actually a, a picture of um, a milk with dignity report that we published last year, which um, details the the successes of the program uh, in its first two years. Um, and although Milk with Dignity wasn't created with a global pandemic in mind, these um, protections and, and mechanisms that, um, that we mentioned have been really uh, even more important during the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, we see farms that are outside of the Milk with Dignity program um, where employers have required farm workers to continue working even if they're sick. Um, or even for people who, who've actually tested positive for COVID. And that leaves farm workers fearful uh, in many cases to, to even tell their bosses if they're symptomatic for fear of, of retaliation. Um, but on, within the Milk of Dignity program, um, on the flip side, having access to personal protective equipment, the kinds of housing improvements that we heard about in the video, have been incredibly helpful in, in reducing the risk of community spread. Uh, and then um, when farm workers do actually get sick, having access to, to paid time off, um, paid sick leave uh, that they can access without the fear of, of being fired or having retaliation for it um, has been incredibly important. Um, and um, you can check out there. These this report is 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 quite long and um, and has a lot of beautiful photos and testimony and, and statistics. Um, so you can check that out on the Migrant Justice website. There's a there's a link to it. But this slide also um, just documents some um, some highlights from the report. Um, so you can see about. Um, Things like wage increases, um, worker housing, like you heard about, paid vacation, sick time. Um, and then over um, $1.8 million have flowed from, from the company, from Ben and Jerry's, at the top of the supply chain um, down to, to farm workers and also to farm owners as this kind of unprecedented um, redistribution of, of profits within the, the industry. Um, so milk with dignity has, has been having a, a really powerful impact, but um, as, I, as I mentioned, milk with dignity only covers 20% of the dairy industry in Vermont. And so that leaves the majority of farms outside of the program. Um, and so um, that means that, that the majority of farm workers um, in the state and in the region continue to, to face um, exploitation and, and issues at work and, and with housing. And so this is a, a photo um, of a, a rally that was organized by um, a farm worker named Jose Ramos. He's, he's the person in the, the green sweatshirt there. And he was working on a dairy farm where he experienced uh, wage theft, intimidation, and actually even violence on the farm from the, the farm owners. And so he decided to, to fight back and he organized this, this protest um, and um, finally uh, was able to win his withhold back wages. Um, but it took more than a year to get those wages through going through the, the Vermont uh, Department of Labor by making a claim with them. And that really shows the difference uh, between farms that are within the Milk with program and, and farms that are not. Because this kind of situation, this kind of abuse that, that Jose Ramos was facing uh, could never have happened on a milk with dignity farm. Because um, first of all, there's, a, there's zero tolerance policies and, and violence is, is a zero tolerance policy within the program that requires immediate, um, immediate response uh, and, and is something that can result in the farm being um, suspended from the program. And then the Milk with Dignity Standards Council is there to make sure that, um, that 
workers are being paid, that no, no um, wages are being withheld. Um, and so this really shows the need to expand the program. And so after a lot of analysis and study of, of the industry as a whole um, and strategy discussions, um, we decided that the next um, target of the Milk with Dignity campaign would be, I wonder if anyone in this uh, presentation knows, I bet some of you do, um, what is the, the current campaign to expand Milk with Dignity? Anybody wanna just like shout it out? Hannafer. Yes, Hannafer, exactly. Um, Hannafer is it. So um, I imagine that that many of you have heard of Hannaford. Many of you probably shop there. Um, I know I do. Hannaford is a, a big store in Vermont. It's oftentimes like the, the main or the only supermarket in some of the towns here. Um, and I know there's a lot of stores also in, in Massachusetts. Um, and across the Northeast, there's um, almost 200 uh, Hannaford stores which makes them a really large buyer of dairy in the region. Um, Hannaford is owned by a multinational corporation called Ahold Delhazy. And Ahold Delhazy has an annual global sales of over $75 billion a year. So in addition to, being, to Hannaford being an important buyer of dairy in the Northeast region, they also can afford this program. They can afford to pay that premium which funds the changes that need to happen on farms uh, to uh, improve conditions and protect rights. And since Hannaford is not just based in Vermont, but across the Northeast, it means that when they join Milk with Dignity, it's gonna have an enormous impact in expanding Milk with Dignity and, and bringing the program to, to hundreds, uh, if not thousands of workers around the region. So to give a little bit of context um, on where things are at with Hannaford, it was the summer of 2019 when we invited um, farmers workers reached out to Hannaford um, to um, invite them to join the program, to talk about them, uh, talk to them about milk and dignity, and there was no response. So at the end of 2019, um, Migrant Justice decided to launch this, this public campaign. Over the last two years, there's been a lot of different ways um, that we've worked to, to build pressure to bring Hannaford to the table. Um, consumers have been a really important part of that, um, writing thousands of emails, hundreds of phone calls, signing petitions, postcards, um, keeping up constant pressure through social media. Also working with um, national organizations to endorse the campaign. Um, and then worker-led actions have been really important. Um, most recently, a, a big march in the state of Maine in November. Um, dozens of coordinated actions across in Vermont, but also across the, the Northeast, um, where delegations make visits to stores. We've done car caravans, um, Christmas protests, May Day, Valentine's Day. Um, and then this fall, actually, um, farm workers went on the road, similar to during the Ben and Jerry's campaign, um, to do a speaking tour and really spread the word about this um, in person across the, the region. Um, and the pandemic, obviously, COVID has really uh, interrupted our actions and made it um, difficult to organize and, and definitely changed what we can and can't do. As you can see, people in this picture have masks on. Um, but we've never let up the pressure uh, and workers are really committed to seeing this campaign too. Um, another piece of this has been putting pressure on Hannaford through their parent company. And that's looked like um, participating in the, the company, the parent company Offold's annual shareholder uh, meeting and working with shareholders. And so those are groups that actually own stocks in, in Hannaford. And this slide um, shows uh, a letter where um, last summer we worked with 75 different shareholders um, to send this letter to Hannaford, urging them to, to join the program. And you can see here that it, it's paired with testimonies from farm workers uh, talking about why, why this program is so important. And then this article was um, 
published as an ad in Maine, the state of Maine, and their uh, one of their largest newspapers last summer, um, which was powerful because Maine is actually like the the home base of Hannaford. That's where their president is, um, and that's where their headquarters is. Um, and so while Hannaford has not responded publicly, they haven't like come out publicly to, to say um, that they're gonna join the program or really any kind of public response. It's clear that um, they're feeling the pressure and trying to find ways to make um, their brand look good. Um, we've seen things like uh, an increase in local donations, um, especially to farms. Um, sometimes like right after we do like a, a phone call day of action, for example, they'll, they'll come out with like this big um, donation announcement. Um, but we say that Band-Aid donations and, and empty promises really don't do anything to address the, the systemic human rights abuses that are happening on, on Hannaford's farms within Hannaford's supply chain. And that really only joining local dignity is, is the way to do that. Um, and so migrant justice, relatively speaking, is, is a fairly small group uh, of farm workers that are standing up to this, this giant corporation that's bringing in billions of dollars every year. Um, and so how are we going to win? How are we going to win this campaign? Um, farm workers and uh, consumers and supporters and allies and students, everyone needs to, to come together to bring Hannaford a loud a consistent message that we expect them to join Milka Dignity and we're not gonna accept anything less. And we really have to work hard to make them realize that the cost to their brand for not signing on to Milka Dignity is higher than it would actually cost them to just sign on to the program and protect workers' rights within their supply chain. We know it's possible to do that because that's what we did with Ben and Jerry's and even though it wasn't easy, it, it took uh, more than three years, we won at the end. And we know that we can win with Hannaford as well. So this is a, on this uh, slide, you see um, a picture of uh, a toolkit that we've developed called the, the Multi Dignity uh, Ally Toolkit, which is a great resource. Um, it's on the Migrant Justice website as well. And just to highlight a couple of things from there, um, this is something that uh, anyone can do who has uh, a phone that connects to the internet and the Facebook app. Um, if you want to take out your phone right now, in fact, um, and look for the Hannaford Supermarket Facebook page, um, farm workers and allies alike have been um, adding comments to Hannaford's posts, uh, calling for milk with dignity. And so you can see a couple here, um, but if you go to their, their Facebook and start looking through their posts, you'll see that there's been hundreds, maybe thousands um, of comments added, uh, as well as like photos and videos. Um, you can write a message like, Hannaford respond to farm workers join milk with dignity or Hannaford, it's time to join milk with dignity. You can, you can get creative. Um, but this has been a really powerful way uh, to use Hannaford's own public platform to um, keep up that, that pressure um, and make them understand that it's, it's not just a few farm workers in Vermont, but it's, it's people across the Northeast, it's people across the, the country that um, care about this issue. Um, another thing we have um, are lawn signs. And that's been, that's been a really cool thing, especially when we were doing the speaking tour in the fall, um, is handing out these lawn signs. Um, and we're happy to mail them to you uh, if um, you're in Massachusetts. We have, there's actually a form on the Migrant Justice website you can fill out to get one. Um, and so they're great to put up in a visible place if you live near Hannaford. Um, we encourage you to, to go out. You can get together with a group of friends, family members, um, and take a photo of this um, lawn sign in front of your local Hannaford and then send it to us. This is something that, that we're collecting. Um, and um, yeah, we, we invite you to, to join us in keeping up the pressure um, and, and escalating the pressure um, towards Hannaford. Um, 
I know there's there's several Hannaford stores in Massachusetts. Um, and this slide actually shows a, a, a little half sheet flyer that we developed um, where we're asking people to um, turn these in to the customer service desk at your local Hannaford. And um, I'll put a link to that in the chat when we come off the, the screen sharing in a minute. But that's a really cool and simple action that you can do. It's, it's something you can do really quickly when you're just like doing your grocery shopping. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Facebook posts are really powerful. That's like a very quick and something that um, you can do a lot. You can invite your friends, your family members to do. Um, we're happy to mail you a lawn sign. Um, if you want to take a picture of yourself, put it somewhere public, take a picture in front of Hannaford. Um, and we'll be in touch. There's, um, there's going to be lots of things coming up in the, several, the next several months. Um, we'll be doing phone call days of actions. We'll be doing more coordinated days of action um, across the region. Um, I imagine we'll be hitting the road and, and, and going to Massachusetts and other states um, when we're able to with COVID. So yeah, we're, we're excited to um, continue to, to connect with you on, work with you on, on this campaign. And with that, um, I think I'm gonna take it off screen share um, so that we can have a discussion. And um, also Thelma, if there's anything you wanna add before we get into the discussion, please feel free. No, no, no. Solo quiero agradecer. Una disculpa más por mi mala conexión. No, I'm sorry. I just want to say thank you and say sorry for the bad connection. There's no problem. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. No need to apologize. Okay, I'm going to put the um, link in the chat to the customer service flyer. But yeah, with that, let's open it up to, to questions, comments, discussion. It was a comment in the chat to say, sorry, I missed it. Does migrant justice work on policy too? Question mark. I'm so glad to see a farm worker saying this raised their bottom line for acceptable working conditions and that it is um, almost uh, functioning as a farm worker union. Um Sorry, I, I just take a minute to like change my, my mind. Could you say again? It's, um... Of course, of course, no problem. Um, it say, sorry if I missed it. Um, does migrant justice work on policy two? Question mark. I'm so glad to see farm workers saying this uh, raise their bottom line for acceptable working conditions and that is almost functioning as a farm worker union. Yeah, I think um, the biggest policy campaign um, is around um, freedom from discrimination and uh, the no mas poli migra. So keeping police, local police from collaborating with border patrol um, and um, ICE in Burma. And that's looked like um, farm workers have worked really hard to create a policy called the fair and impartial policing policy. Um, which then was um, weakened during the Trump administration. Um, and so that continues to be a really uh, important campaign to close the loopholes and really like uh, build a wall between the, the cops and, um, and immigration. You know, so it's a question by Liz, uh, does migrant justice work with any unions in your state? A group of 12 farm workers at the at a vineyard on Long Island just got the first farm worker union in New York.
puedo responder esa pregunta si, si quieres más. Eh, tenemos a uh, organizaciones. I, I can answer that. Uh, we have some brothers um, ones, but we we ourselves don't. We have some that we do have some connections in New York and in Rhode Island. And mostly with the campaign that we have now, there's a lot of groups that are helping us. Gracias. Thank you. Any Thank more you. questions? You can put it. Alguna otra pregunta? Uh, mute. Más preguntas? Puedes ponerlas en el chat o puedes uh, quitarte de the mute. Yo tengo una pregunta. I have a question. I don't know if English or Spanish is better. <laughs> Whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I'll say it in English and then maybe translation. Uh, the question is normally we perceive Vermont como, uh, as a state that it's almost like a paradise. It is a progressive state full of mountains and ski resorts where there's or everybody seems to be really happy and, and not suffer at all, at all, no? And so listening to these stories, you can see how paradoxical it is that the people who um, are working to make sure that Americans have food are the ones who are suffering to buy food. And so I was wondering what was the reaction of Vermonters and Vermont businesses to see that a immigrant group from a different culture than American white culture is gaining strength through organizing? Um, how does how do Vermonters feel about um, these people organizing to fight for their rights? No, are is the local Vermont community? supporting them or are they resisting these um, resistances from immigrants? Muchas gracias, Juan Camilo, por esta reflexión de cómo se mira todo, porque... Thank you for the reflection about how things look, because for us it's very important to share the voice of the community and talk as workers so that people can see the real conditions. 10 years ago, people didn't know that there was so many immigrants working in, in ranches or in farms. Um, at that time, we were not coming out of the shadows and now we are. After 10 years or a little more than 10 years of organizing, the people in Vermont listen to our stories and support what we're doing. I don't feel like there's that much resistance in the people of Vermont, but the people that can make the changes are the ones that are given resistance. But there's been a lot of help and a lot of people that had helped this program grow, but the people that have the power to change things make it difficult for the workers. With the campaign that we have with Hannah Ford, they're very resistant. They're being resistant, but it's very important to raise up our voice and that way they could hear where the food really comes from and who brings the food to their tables. And right now here, it's only four degrees Fahrenheit and people are out in the fields working without protection in these conditions. And they're awful conditions, awful living conditions. And we need people to notice that when they're eating yogurt and drinking milk and having some cheese to see who are the people working to get this to their tables and not forget their workers and have the solidarity with them. And, and then talk about the corporates that benefit from this. Thank you. Thank you. Lupita. Uh, 
There's another question in the chat. There's another. Right? Have you encountered pushbacks about more expensive um, product as a result of like more expensive in semicolons as a result of fair working conditions? Do you have any specific figures of myth busting facts that you can share about how we can have better labor conditions without pushing that cost? into the consumer. I'm thinking of how it sometimes feel like one sector. No entiendo of, la pregunta. Um, la pregunta te la puedo decir en español. Que si has encontrado. Um, si que you, a veces, I didn't understand the question. The question asked about, you know, sometimes that the, the, sometimes the, the, the businesses owner said, okay, so to make this change, we have to do, we have to do this, we have to make this change. And um, um, so, so the question asked, like, if you have resources to, to dismantle the lie, the lie that they, the promises that they give them, basically. And the second part of the question is, is that this, this type of, that this type of myth uh, makes uh, co-workers fight between each other, kind of debating between each other. Um, someone was just asking me if I could respond to this one. Um, I got a, a little confused too, but I can respond to the chat question um, about um, a more expensive product and pitting like working class struggle against um, better food conditions, better food and working conditions. Um, and, and that is, um, I think that part of the structure um, with this model is is really powerful for that because the money is actually coming from the top down, the, the CEOs and the, and the brands that are making the profit. And so uh, consumers aren't actually paying extra. But Ben & Jerry's actually is a pretty expensive product already. It's, it's kind of a fancy food to begin with. And so um, another reason I think that the Hannaford campaign is really powerful is it's just a supermarket and Hannaford brand milk is one of the cheaper milks in the store. So it's going to be a really awesome way for people to participate in food justice when Hannaford signs on. Um, there have been some cool, um, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers that Migrant Justice um, has collaborated with and learned a ton from in Florida. They had a campaign um, that was like one cent more for your tomatoes um, because tomatoes have been a big part of their fair food program. Um, and I think that was really eye-opening for people to see that just like one cent more could create this like incredible change uh, for workers across the industry. And then it's not like it has to cost a ton for consumers, even if there is a consumer cost, it was like one cent more can end abuse in your tomatoes and your food that you're putting into your body. Um, so I think it's a really important point and something I find inspiring about this, this model is that I think it gets it, it, it gets beyond hitting those two struggles against each other. Thank you for that answer. Um, so um, I saw some comments in the chat, more comments in the chat. I don't see any questions, but um, in the meantime, I would like if folks can, for a second, just put your cameras on so I can take a picture for, for um, send it to the folks of Migrant Justice and all our members. So uh, it would be good to see you for a moment. Okay. 
Say cheese with justice. No. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your stories and really doing this work. Gracias por darnos sus historias, contarnos sus experiencias y estar aquí presentes en la conferencia. She's saying the same uh, thing in English, in Spanish. Un par de minutos más, si alguien we más have a quiere. few more minutes. Uh, uh, if anybody else has another question. If not, we would like to thank uh, the interpreters. Um, they have been working all day. Thank you. And also the presenters. Okay, there's another question. There's another question. Do you want Camilo to ask, ask it? I will do it in Spanish. The question, what is the, what is the role of women in this movement, in this uh, justice movement? Usually you only see men, you know, and you see the men, like you imagine them to be the giants um, of this movement and all that. Um, and then from your experience, Lupita, what is the role and the importance of, of women uh, in the, the fight of the rights of, of the workers? Thank you for the question. This, throughout the years, it's been just a few women working. Usually there's only men. I would say that here in Vermont, I was one of the few women, the first few women that that, that got into it. You know, I was part of the committee uh, and, and I was a, a leader and then a, a, a speaker. And, and now we we have more women joining us. And, and that is also thankful. Um, I'm thinking the, the changes that we have implemented uh, that has also been helpful in gaining more women in the movement. Uh, you know, but there, there's also um, uh, still some uh, discrimination, uh, gender discrimination is still in it. You know, uh, we also include in this, in this uh, talking to women about the rights, uh, you know, because the, there is some inequity in gender that still exists. And then in our committee, uh, we 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 straight and we we talk about this in the different farms as well about the equality and the gender and and, and we we encourage you to do this the same we are here learning and working towards educating other women about about this thank you thank you both of you for being here with us with no with us thank you i don't know if you want to to close any comments for closing say something or this will be it No sé si no sé si si habían más preguntas, pero con la pregunta que hizo con, con lo que estaba yo respondiendo Juan Camilo. I don't know if there are more questions, but what I what I was answering to Juan Camilo, I want to say that milk with dignity, this program, with the politics, the politics that we have now implemented, it has become a safe place for women to work, and and thank to. Thanks to the program, there has been women that has been um, come forward to to talk about the harassment that they've been um, subject to. And this is this is unique. This is unique. I I was I was you know a worker at, at a farm as well, and when these things happened, nothing happened. Nothing nothing was done. Um, and now to have those changes. 
So, so I, I, I ask you to, to, to educate yourself more, go to our website and, and to learn more about our programs and our uh, movement. And then again, to support us, please support us. We need that. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks to, to all the organizers with NOFA MA and, and everyone who's here as a participant. We're, we're thrilled to connect and, and excited to, to work on worker justice and food justice and, and community to the forward. Thank you.